Uh, when we were thinking about a speaker for tonight, I have to tell you, I fell in love with Consuelo. We, we met uh, in May at, at uh, another festive evening here, and we got to talking, and she, she confessed to me she was a jugular speaker. <laughs> Goes for the jugular. I said, she'd be perfect for the director's circle. So let me quote her, because she's uh, not only an artist, but an educator, and really a passionate uh, promoter of craft. She says, I think for this time and age that crafts are essential. I think for this time and age that crafts are essential. And you know what? I think you believe that too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here supporting us. So we are fortunate to have two works by Consuelo in the collection. One downstairs in the Benaroya Court named Run Jane Run from 2004. And Consuelo and I were saying, you were ready to make that piece years earlier, and it still feels so fresh today. That's, uh, that's the mark of great art as well. So you're in for a treat. You're going to have a wonderful conversation with Consuela, and I hope that our brilliant curator, Nora Atkinson, the Fleur and Charles Bressler curator in charge of the Renwick, can keep up, but I know she, uh, they'll have some good repartee. Uh, again, Consuela reminds us, I think for this time and age, that crafts are essential. I'm gonna borrow your quote and insert museums. For this time and age, museums are essential. I think we all believe that because we can craft a better world together. Uh, we can showcase artists who help us, again, better understand this very complex moment we're living through. And again, inspire a better future for all of us. We highlight artists who also grapple with our complicated past. Uh, and we, of course, look to inspire all of our visitors, uh, particularly our school children and future artists, to see the world differently through the objects we hold and trust. We are keepers of artworks, we are conservators of artworks, and they connect us across time and space. And for me, as I know for you, artwork amazes me. It is awe-inspiring, it provokes me, and especially there are works that still frustrate me that I'm still working through, um, and artists who I'm always getting to know a little bit better. We're also storytellers. We talk about process, we talk about the power of art. And so I thank you for helping us craft a better world through art. Thank you, our dear Director Circle members. Let me tell you a little bit about her because you really want to hear from her. She was born in Sacramento, California. Her parents were migrant agricultural workers. Her mother was Chicana and her father was of Huichol descent. And this incredible history, this great heritage has been central to how she sees the world and creates memorable pieces. She negotiates between different perspectives. American, Mexican, and indigenous, and also negotiates and contrasts the conflict that we have at our borderlands, particularly the US and Mexican border. We have two of her works in the collection, and uh, she's featured in many museums, so be on the lookout for her. The Museum of Art and Design holds her work, the National Hispanic Center for the Arts in New Mexico, the Mexican Museum in San Francisco, and the Oakland Museum of art in California, as well as Crystal Bridges in, uh, uh, in Bentonville, and, and many more. Needless to say, people like to give her awards, so let me tell you a few things that she has recently received. In 2018, she was elected to the very prestigious Council of Fellows of the American Craft Council. In 2021, the Masters of the Medium Award by our own James Renwick Alliance for Craft, and in 2022, the first recipient of a new prize, the Mellon Foundation's Latinx Artist Fellowship. More awards ahead, I assure you, Consuelo, and we will be cheering you on. She was, uh, received her MFA at San Jose State University in 1987, and they were very smart to keep her as one of their great professors for some 20 years, and inspiring a whole other generation of artists. She built up their craft program over the years, and again, she is truly creating the next generation of artists. There's a new uh, book out about her, Consuela Jimenez Underwood, Art Weaving Vision, out by Duke University Press. We're delighted she is here tonight with her dear husband, uh, Marcos Underwood, a member of the Yaqui uh, Nation, and the delightful favorite daughter, 
I'm an only daughter, so I know how only daughters can be favorite daughters. Valina is with us tonight. And um, if you really love her work, I'm also delighted that her great supporter, the gallerist Patricia Ruse Healy, is here tonight as well. Anyway, you want to hear really from Nora and Consuelo, so why don't you please um, help me welcome them to the stage. Thank you again. Well, hello, everybody, and hello, Consuelo. Hi, Nora. So I wanted to start with this piece, uh, Virgin de los Camenos, uh, which the Renwick acquired in 1996. And I think that this piece is kind of a quiet masterpiece of yours. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how this piece came into being and some of the recurring themes in your work that come out in this piece and a little bit of your background. Okay, she just asked for a 30-minute lecture, but I'm going to do it in three. So, um, in 94, I was already running with academia, trying to be the mom and the, the educator at San Jose State University, and also uh, an artist, weaver. I was uh, adamant uh, that weaving was just as a viable as any other craft, and certainly it was considered art as far as I was concerned. My mission was to bring the, uh, the border down between craft and art. So by 94, I think I, I managed to do so, and this was one of the pieces where I went, darn it, I'm traveling all the time because of academia, and I need something to do in the airplane, and I'm going to embroider flowers. And for over two years, as I traveled around making lectures and connections, um, I embroidered, and that's what this piece. Now, why did I do flowers? I never really was fond of flowers as a young person. Um, I thought the world was too harsh for their reality, and I questioned their existence. And my granddaughter was born, and they named her Xochitl, which was a name that means flower in Nahuatl, and was the name that my father wanted to name me. Um, but my granddaughter got the name, and all of a sudden, the world was filled with flowers. So for a couple of years, all I did was embroider flowers. And that's how this piece came to be. Now, how it came to be in, in the Smithsonian, a wonderful man called Kenneth Trapp had already acquired my pieces for the Oakland Museum. And when he saw this in process, he said, we're going to get this piece, so hang on to it. And lo and behold, as soon as I finished it, Kenneth So here we are. That's how this piece came to be. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in the presentation. So should I continue? So, OK, well, here we go. Hang on, folks. I'm going <laughs> jugular. Right now, what am I doing? I'm still doing the same thing I was doing since I was an undergrad and what I promised myself at eight years old, trying to cross that border with my dad, who was undocumented. I was born in Sacramento, so I picked crops up and down the whole state. I claimed the whole state. My dad wasn't. And ever since then, at eight or nine, I went, you know, this is so bad. I got to unite. Something's wrong. And to this day, I'm still trying to do that. This is me just basically a couple of months ago working on merging the two nations again on my right. And on the left, I'm trying to merge an ancient deity from the Americas with the current flag of the Americas. Uh, it started out real bleak, it seemed to everybody, but I knew that, uh, okay, Consuelo, you're in this predicament of poverty and bottom of the social class only so you could rise. How high can you rise? I don't know, but I did know that I could have the body, mind, and spirit at an eight that were separate inside of me, and it was up to us and every one of us who have all these three things to unite them and focus and move forward, in my case, up. So at nine, I had, I developed my 10-year decade plan to go through life. And at 14 or 13 here, 1963, that's my mom, me, in the prune field of Vacaville, California, Northern California, and uh, 30 cents a box. And look at how happy I am. How can you not be happy? I was looking forward to being the second decade when I would pick no more. And I had the powers of the Virgen de Guadalupe, the fierce history of the revolution with Zapata, and the caution sign. Hmm. <laughs> so uh, here I am now in 1983. I had just arrived at um, 
San Jose State with my MA from San Diego where I learned form. At San Jose, I was challenged by content and context, the difference, and their different powers. As an artist, I felt totally empowered. I went, you know, if I get those three down with the thread and needle, I'm going somewhere. And sure enough, this was my first merging of a life-size Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, Virgen of the Headlights. And I'll, that's another lecture. It was made with bamboo. This one was made, again, my Virgins are dark. They're unhappy. This is California conservative politics going on. The caution sign was becoming to be very popular. They were starting to even put it in Texas. Here we are, my first barbed wire weaving, five feet across. How did I get that barbed wire through the wet warp? That was another that was another phenomenon. And to this day, I still use barbed wire, and now it's leather. And they asked me, why are you still using that? The border's still here. Of course I'm gonna use it. And this is the Virgen de los Caminos. On this one, I embroidered the barbed wire. And I also made the Virgen dark, but beautiful. And why is she dark? Because she's angry. These borders are not, are not, are not acceptable, I think, in the land of the flowers. And if you notice uh, closely, the caution sign is the quilting pattern. And why are they so invisible? Why don't you want people to see them? Because people don't see these people as they run across the highway. They don't. They somehow, you, you just ignore it and move on and look at flowers and me know, I know they're there always. So now we come to Run yes. Jane Run. So now we come to Run Jane Run. Yes. So now we come to Run Jane Run, which we just acquired. This was a piece from 2004, um, which was part of the Runwix 50th anniversary acquisitions campaign through a generous donation of the Altoras Foundation. And this piece to me really highlights that deep investment with craft beyond just the conceptual framework, uh, that marriage between materials and process and theme that you bring to the work. So. It's I'd the, love for you to explore that a little more. Oh, well, you, you just summed it up. The body, mind, and spirit. You know, I was appalled when I saw this sign. For me, it was going to, in, it was going to imprint a whole generation of young people who saw this sign to, it's okay, they're just running across the freeway. It's okay. And I identified with that little girl. And I went, uh, I wanted to weave this piece earlier, but because of academia, I was, uh, I was, I was not able to, but as soon as I determined in my head, you look at Kutzwala, you got the full-time tenure, you've already done that, why don't you leave academia so you can do your real love? You've already educated people, young people, to use a thread, a needle, instead of a paintbrush, or not instead, but along with a paintbrush, a camera, whatever you do, you can always incorporate thread and needle, what's the problem? So once, uh, 10 years of that, I went, oh, I gotta start learning how to get out of here. And so this was, and when I leave, I'm gonna weave a giant caution sign with the, with the, in, with the filter, with the gaze of the indigenous woman of long ago, kind of appalled at the sign, and more importantly, look at the backstrap loom that I, I tried to evoke a backstrap because I was now using a floor loom, but I wanted to emulate or pay honor to the backstrap weavers. And this is the barbed wire again as the, the head holder for the piece, and caution tape as warp, I mean as weft, and of course I'm using material as context. And the idea of, of de de dehumanizing the, the, the family was, you know, challenging our spirit, our, our, our mind, you know, is this really what we're gonna be doing as a nation? So can you talk a little bit about um, your process in creating the work, in coming up with the idea, and then moving through at the time that it takes? Oh my gosh, yes. The idea I, I told you was when I first saw that sign. One, we're celebrating the Berlin, well, Berlin Wall coming down, and we're putting up this sign over here along with the wall. The second thing was, I got to make it big. I got to make everybody see it. Not just people who could drive across the border should be able to see it. All of America should see it. Everyone should see this sign, how we have run, families running. And do it with what? Are you going to paint it on enamel? Reprodu no. 
I'm going to do it the indigenous voice of the woman. The woman indigenous voice did her statements with thread and needle. I will do the same. And in this case, that's, that's what prompted me to make the scale, to make the sign, and determine that this is the way I was going to do it. And the title of the work? Oh, Run, Jane, Run. Uh, primer, remember, see Jane run, run, Dick, run. It was so easy for me to learn that coming into first grade in October, because that was the end of the picking season. But it was very easy for me to dominate those books with, with reading. And I was, uh, I was given a, a glimpse of hope that maybe if I just stuck to my guns and really uh, pushed into uh, knowledge by reading nothing but, but, but fact, doing nothing but investigating how, why we came to be in this situation, that when I grew up, I would know more than enough so that I could put the knowledge that I could read and write into fruition. I was always torn between writing and, and art, but I think the, uh, the art gave way because I am body and my body loves threads. It loves that process. I feel ancient. I feel the elders are, hurry up, Consuelo, do it, do it, tell them, tell them. I feel them. I even feel Van Gogh, who may, you may not know, his first paintings were of weavers because that's where he lived when he left his home to paint. And I felt his spirit there. And so I, I when I weave and I do these things, I feel them in my studio, I welcome them in, and of course all the elders in my family that I know went through quite a bit, as all of ours did. And Consuelo, I remember you talking about your father weaving when you were young, and so this is a tradition from your family. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, because my dad was undocumented in the wintertime, he would kind of hide from the INS, we used to call it back then, Homeland Security now, um, but uh, he would hide because there was no work in the fields, and up until the age I was five or six years old, he would weave dresses for me on a frame loom. And because uh, the, my step uncles and step brothers, they all made fun of how this man from Jalisco weaving, he put it down. So I feel that he's, uh, he, my, his mother wove, his grandmother wove, but he, I think, was homesick. He was over there in Sacramento, away from everything, ostracized, and, but he had me, and I had him. And that was special. That's what he passed on to me, how to think about time, how to think about the, earth, the wind, how to think about the earth, how to think about being good, being a good person. And he would do it with stories when I was weaving. So that's what I'm trying to continue. I think I succeeded because now I'm affecting, especially in this incredible present moment when the piece is up at the Renwick, I am now affecting the public in a different way, not accepting what went down, but questioning why. Why do we have this sign? And I love this image of this young man staring, wondering, hmm. Nora, Mary, Stephanie, you're brilliant. You saw this and you went for it. I'm so happy because I feel I succeeded. Everything I do now is not, not doesn't have to feel so intense. Because, <laughs> and then, guess what? I see this image. Talk about intensity. This so, is a Texas red winged blackbird. And when it migrates, there's always hundreds going over the Texas border. And then variably, there's a group that comes down and slams into the wall. So this was a group of works that you showed us while we were in the midst of our acquisitions campaign. And Mary and I really fell in love with it. And we decided to acquire Run Jane Run, but um, this one was very close to our hearts. Oh, this is, this um, is a, a, a recent work, I think a couple of years old at the most. But I felt so bad, I was still traumatized with, uh, with that, that the birds, why do they do that? And when they hit, they die from the impact and they fall and by the next day everything's gone because all the predators that are to be, they devour everything. And so I went, I have to do something. 
And so with needle and thread and planning and tough wire and a little bit of hope at the top and fragility of material and form, I stitched the birds and the border wall together after they were woven. And here they are, the moment of impact. And I still wonder, were they like the monks in Vietnam that during the Vietnam War they burnt themselves? Is that what these birds are doing? Or are they really totally blind and for some reason they just want to go down? I don't know. And I think that's our, our wonder that we should think about. Here's a Libro that Stephanie was talking about, 10 years. But Lauda and Anne Marie, good friends, incredible scholars, they drank the Kool-Aid and they went for it. <laughs> there it is. Did I do it? <laughs> Very good. Well, I guess we will turn it over to audience questions, but while we wait for a microphone then, um, I will ask you one more question, Consuelo. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, we had one question from earlier today from my colleague Howard in our external affairs department, and it was, have you ever been a comic? Because we have collaborated with Ringling College of Arts and Design on an amazing series of comics, um, which are based on the lives of artists, and I think that you are a very strong contender for the next round of that. So, comics. comics. Did you say comics? Like you could live a, another life as a drawn character. How do you feel? What would I? What would I be? Your whole life. My whole life. Your life in comics. <laughs> wow. There is so little time in this world. In, in 10 years, we sleep three. You know that. There's only seven years left in a decade. What are the seven years? Four of them is to deal with the mundane. Four of them are to deal with whatever you want to do. I, I, I knew I had to do threads. I would have loved to pick up the guitar. I would have loved to pick up languages. I would have loved to, a lot of things. But time is short. I've only got four or five. I, at the, when I realized that time was short, I realized I had only five, six decades. Five, six times four is 28. 28 years. Oh my God, Consuelo, you got to get out of this place. <laughs> and now I feel like I have 10 years or another decade, maybe two, and... It takes two or three, I make two or three pieces a year. So I'm thinking, I got like 20 good, strong pieces left. And that's what I feel is the, is the most, uh, what did you call, uh, it's, it's the common thread for me. I've got to produce because I feel that I'm the only one kind of working with the thread as in this way. I feel that. I look for other artists, but they're different. And I'm very committed to the needle and thread ever since 1979 when I entered San Diego State and art versus craft was the big discussion. And I went, what a border. I'm going to cross that one. I'm going to merge art and craft. And sure enough, by the time I graduated, I did. So I can go on, folks, but... <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. I was one of the only graduate students that would ask the professors, please come into my studio, ask me anything, please, because I knew I'm the only one that can answer it. Before you put needle and thread together, you have an idea. How do you transition that idea to the physical reality in terms of documenting, recording, organizing your thoughts and feelings? Well, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked. I always have two or three projects. As one ends, I go, okay, turn on the faucet. Which idea wants to come in? I think ideas are sacred. If you get an idea and it comes from deep within, 
then you're committed to that idea. So how do I, how do I begin? Uh, I first have to finish the masterpiece in front of me, and congruently, I'm looking at the world, and that's how I saw the birds, and I went, okay, so for a year, I will research, think about the drama, is it is it or, or the work that's that we're going to be creating and and going back and forth is it going to be worth the two or three seasons to make that statement and as i finish the ones that i'm working on the the ideas will either continue to be there or not if they're there then the second year is how and accruing all the materials because the beautiful and the horrible thing about this life is that there's so many choices. It, the most difficult thing is to decide which one, which thread, which kind of red, what kind of, 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 of linen do I want to hear? And once that is going, once that starts defining itself clearly by the studio yarn going, I want to play, I want to play, then I collect them, and by the third, the end of the second year, we're, run, we're running. Then the serious sketches come with the dimensions and the inches and, and, uh, and the statement starts becoming. So by the time I'm weaving, it's already over. So it's like, okay, get the MO, just get up in the morning, hit that loom and keep weaving and two of the other two projects, oh, this one's finishing, what am I gonna do next? So I'm already filled with two or three ideas and that's another lecture too. <laughs> do, do we dare ask what the next ideas are? Uh, one is the beautiful Patricia acquired a, 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 what do you call it, a, a con, uh, what do you call a commission? And uh, what do, what do you, uh, anything you want? Oh my gosh, well then I'm going to do what I want to do, the next merging of the two flags. And that's what you saw in that first slide when I'm on the wall to the right. I was merging, that was what I'm working on now, merging the two flags, but this one's different. This one, it will actually have uh, the, cara, the Mexican eagle, but it's called the cara cara. And that is, uh, the, uh, that is a, a border uh, bird that lives in the borderlands, and they too are affected by the border. And so for me, it's like, oh, I can do this. I love merging the two flags, and now we're going to put a, 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 a bird face in my weavings. So that's pretty challenging and exciting. And the other one is Cuatlique, I don't know if you know ancient Mesoamerica. She's the original Virgen de Guadalupe. It was on her el temple that the Virgen appeared to Don Juan. And she is the Earth Mother deity. So I'm trying to put her via stitching and painting onto that immense US flag that you saw. So I'm merging her image with that. So that's gonna keep me going through probably next spring. And then I already have the sketches for the next drama, which are fractured flags. The unity of the U, of the two nations, however, they're fractured. And I'm debating whether I really want to do my homage, which I haven't done yet, to the celestial, to the stars, to the night. I'm thinking even maybe even the cartwheel galaxy. But something, so I haven't done, I've done my homage to the waters. I have done, done my homage to the earth. I've done my homage to the buffalo. And I'm thinking I need to do the stars because they inspired me as a child that they're so beautiful and there's so many and they're all just one star, really. I mean, we don't, it's one universe and we're all cells. And that drama of the, 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 the incredible, you can't even count how many galaxies and stars up there. And then knowing that we are made up of cells, little galaxies. Everybody, everything. That's so exciting. I want people, I, I, I'm thinking maybe, as, you're, as I'm speaking, maybe the next one after the fractured flags, and you know, maybe it will be about how do you tell people that when you hold a pebble, you're holding the mountain? That's a challenge. 
How do you do that beautifully and honor the mountain and honor the pebble and honor the person or the people, in my case, the elders, the old anonymous stitchers and weavers from all over the world that made incredible objects that I just bow to. So I, I, I want to, as I feel my sand clock, I tell people, I see it falling down. I, it, it's at the edge. And the, you know when a sand clock at the bottom, it goes faster and faster and faster. And I feel now at 73, maybe t one or two more decades left of work and I know I've done the celestial. I don't know what's after that. After those ideas, I'm booked for now 22. Reaching for the stars. <laughs> uh, do we have another question? Come on. One more. All righty. <laughs> Did your dad ever get to see your work <gasps> and see what he inspired in you? Yes, and yes. He lived with me his last 10 or 13 years, and that's when I was, he was so proud, and I knew he was proud. <laughs> Woo! Bop. He was a good, good person, and he made me strong. And when it was really hot, and it was really noontime, picking tomatoes in the Sacramento Valley, over 100 degrees, or picking the prunes in September when it was really hot, and it went on forever, the orchards, and you knew you had to quick, pick quickly because the school bus was coming, and you had to jump on the bus and get into school and learn everything, and then get off the bus and go back down. It was hard, but you know what he would do when he saw that we were really, ex really like, oh my God, I can't do this. I, he would start singing, and he had a beautiful voice, and he loved singing, and so he would sing, and I swear, everybody picking would put an ear, and it felt good. So that's why I love music. Maybe in my next, I'll be music. I would never allow to learn music. I was always going to school way too late in October. I'd never studied art until college because I couldn't get into those classes. So uh, he taught me a lot. He, I, show, I saw he would never, even watching television, he was always doing something with his hands. He was always creative, always positive, and he always loved me. Well, on that very beautiful memory, thank you so much. And one last big round of applause for both Nora and Consuelo. Thank you both.